All right. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the final program in our series of Friday talks during the month of October at the Arthur Ross Gallery at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Our speaker today is Roxana Filipowska, who I will more fully introduce in a moment. To start out, we would like to acknowledge that the land that we are calling in from or zooming in from is part of the unceded ancestral lands of the Lenai Lenape people whose presence and resilience in Pennsylvania continues to this day. We recognize and acknowledge that the University of Pennsylvania stands on the indigenous territory known as Lenape Hoking, the traditional homelands of the Lenape. To open up our program, we welcome you to use the chat feature to say hello and let us know where you are Zooming from. Uh, and if you would like to acknowledge the indigenous history of your area, we invite you to do so. Uh, my colleague Suzanne is running our communications today, uh, managing the chat and Q&A. So please use the chat feature for greetings and comments and the Q&A feature for questions, which we will address at the end of today's program. Uh, this has been a difficult week in Philadelphia following the tragic death of Walter Wallace Jr., who was a community member in West Philadelphia. The Arthur Ross Gallery stands against racism and systemic inequities, and we strive to prevent, present exhibitions and programming that leads to a more equitable and caring world. If you have suggestions for how we might support anti-racist efforts and the care of our community, please be in touch. All of our contact information is on our website, which is arthurrossgallery.org. Today's talk is part of our current exhibition at the Arthur Ross Gallery titled Rematerialize. This is an exhibition that features four contemporary artists who incorporate recycled or repurposed materials in their artistic practice. And those artists are El Anatsui, Shari Mendelssohn, Jackie Milland, and Alison Saar. The gallery is open with rematerialize on view in real life from Tuesday through Sunday. Masks are required and we are offering free timed tickets to ensure that everyone can visit the gallery safely and have plenty of space. And I'd like to say that this spacing out of visitors also offers you the opportunity to really commune with these artworks that we have on view. And if you've read the essay that Roxana Filipowska wrote for this exhibition, you might catch the fact that I'm referencing her essay um, and using the word commune. So for scheduling your commune with the exhibition rematerialize, you can head to arthurrossgallery.org for details and scheduling your visit. Please also note that we will be offering one more public virtual program uh, for this season on Friday, December 4th at noon, when Dr. Wayne Modest from the Research Center for Material Culture in the Netherlands will join us. And he will be speaking on environmental precarity as connected to the artworks of Alison Saar in our exhibition, Rematerialize. So at this point, I would like to take a moment to more formally introduce our speaker uh, and welcome Roxana. <laughs> It's wonderful to see you. Roxana Filipowska is the Wordle Study Center Programs and Outreach Manager at Yale University Art Gallery. She completed her PhD in art history here at the University of Pennsylvania. She has an extensive list of publications, um, but to mention a couple that relate in my mind most closely to today's talk, she wrote the chapter titled Re Morton's Celastic Turn in the ICA's exhibition catalog titled Re Morton from 2019, uh, as well as Richard Hamilton's Plastic Problem in Distillations Magazine from 2016. Filipowska's book project is titled Take Great Care, Global Plastic and the Movement of Plasticity. And this book examines the impact of plastic materials on art making, conservation and theory since the 1960s and formulates plasticity as a mode of resistance against such hegemonic operations as sameness and scalability. And of course, I would like to highlight Roxana's essay um, that was commissioned for our exhibition Rematerialize. And um, we'll put that link in the chat in case you haven't accessed that already. Um, uh, her essay is titled Rematerializing Care, Plastic and Plasticity in the Work of Sherry Mendelssohn. Uh, in, in this essay, Filipowska looks at 
uh, Mendelssohn's work through the lens of the history of the consumer relationships uh, with plastic throughout the 20th century, uh, and also the theoretical perspective of the imaginative, imaginative potential of plastic um, as activated in Sherry Mendelssohn's sculptures. Um, so Roxana, I would like to thank you for this essay and the contribution to the scholarship on plasticity, as well as Shari Mendelssohn's work. Um, it's been influential in the way that I think of Shari Mendelssohn's work as the curator for this exhibition. And I'm really looking forward to um, what you have to say uh, about plastics and plasticity and care uh, in our program today. So at this point, um, I, I welcome you. Thank you for joining us. And I'm going to turn the presentation over to you. Thank you so much, Heather, for that generous introduction and for the invitation to write for this exhibit and also to speak today. I'd like to thank Suzanne for uh, support in today's program. And I'd also, of course, like to thank Shari Mendelssohn for being such a generous interlocutor. Uh, Shari, if you're on this call, it has been a pleasure to think and write with you and your work. This is a hard week in a year of hard weeks, uh, and I'm grateful for everyone taking the time to join us today. I'd like to invite you to take a moment to maybe decide what you would like to do to make yourself more comfortable for this next uh, 45 minutes or so that we are spending together. Um, perhaps turn off your email to minimize distraction, perhaps take a deep inhale and a deep exhale. Uh, we are in unusual times, so please know that pets and children are welcome. You may hear my dog in the background at some point during this presentation. And for those of you who are enjoying lunch, I'd like to wish you Bon Appetit, and I am Polish, so I also wish you smacznego. Okay. So I'll begin my presentation at the end, and by that I mean the end of my essay for the exhibit Rematerialize, because I see this talk as a complement to that piece of writing. I conclude my essay with a quote by Saidia Hartman, who is a professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia University. The quote is, care is an antidote to violence. And Hartman shared this word bomb in the year 2017 at a celebration of scholar Christina Sharp and her book, In the Wake on Blackness and Being. Care as a remedy or a corrective to violence is on display throughout Rematerialize. And I know that many people on this call might not have had a chance to visit the exhibit. So I'd like to just contextualize my talk and Sherry Mendelssohn's work with just a quick overview of some of um, the amazing work that's in this exhibit. El Anatsui repurposes aluminum printing plates into a large scale sculpture of a West paper bag, an object that has been used to negatively represent Ghanaian refugees who used these bags to transport their belongings when they were forced to leave Nigeria. These bags and the people who use them are monumentalized through Anatsui's laborious process of sculpting with copper and wire. Here we have a close-up detail of one of the works by Jackie Malad. And Malad explores her hybrid identity as an Egyptian, Honduran American by recycling and collaging images and iconography from each of the cultures that influence her. And Alison Saar prints images of imagined and real Black women, girls, and femmes on salvaged textiles such as antique lace handkerchiefs and sacks that once held sugar, animating lost histories of Black livelihood. Upon first glance, Sherry Mendelssohn's work may appear surprising in this exhibition because her chosen material of consumer plastic bears no specific origin. Indeed, the idea of consumer plastic rematerializing may actually inspire apprehension. Plastic is a material that many wish would decay and disappear. 
Though accurate, it is perhaps too simple to say that Mendelssohn's care for discarded consumer plastic is a corrective to the violence of plastic pollution. As someone who has thought about plastics a lot, uh, what I appreciate about these ubiquitous materials is that they force me to ask such thorny questions as, when is care a form of violence? And which paradigms of care ensure the safety of some at the expense of others? I'm now zooming in at one of the works in this exhibit from Sherry Mendelssohn so that you can really see that this uh, amphora, this form that's so evocative of so many different cultures throughout time is actually, uh, it features many, many plastic bottles. And you can see the, the, the bottom of these bottles as creating these almost crustacean forms on this amphora. At the start of this program series, when Mendelssohn was giving her artist talk, a member of the audience asked, how long will these works last? And I think this question reveals that plastic materials inspire a double anxiety. Let's take the single use plastic bottle, for instance, which we, for instance, see fe uh, featured here in this image. It is estimated that a plastic bottle probably a plastic water bottle, will last about 450 years when not properly recycled. 450 years is too long for the environment. And we know that the mismanagement of plastic results in pileups and landfills. It results in water pollution and discarded objects breaking down into microplastics that are consumed by fish, and eventually by humans. At the same time, 450 years is not long enough for art institutions. Whereas encyclopedic and historic museums boast of holdings that span millennia, we know that 20th century artworks featuring plastic materials are undergoing rapid decay. And here we are looking at two artworks and a replica. On the left, you have Antoine Pevsner portrait of Marcel Duchamp from 1926. It is made of cellulose nitrate and copper on iron. On the upper right, we have Naum Gabo's construction in space with balance on two points. And you can see that it's actually tipping over. It's really unable to balance at this point. Uh, this upper, uh, the work in the upper right is also made in 1926, but features cellulose acetate, a different plastic. And on the lower right, we have the historic replica of the Gabo sculpture, which was constructed in 1967 out of plexiglass. Each of those three art objects that we see on screen right now, uh, they're all considered fragile and in need of care. So plastic materials span a vast spectrum of value with a single use water bottle representing one end of the spectrum. An artwork in a museum collection that features plastic materials occupies the other end of the spectrum because museums by their existing definition are tasked with the preservation of cultural artifacts. Today, I would like to share some of the images I've come across that illuminate how consumer plastics habituate its users towards care or disinterest. Because Mendelssohn primarily works with plastic packaging, I will stick with a few examples of this form of synthetic materials. So published in 1955, this Life magazine article is cited as the source of the term throw away society. So you can see the same shot from two different angles here. The trio that we see appears gleeful while single use containers, plates and trays rain on them like confetti. The scene suggests that single use plastic will free mid-century consumers from the burden of cleaning and that is cause to celebrate. Here, the single use plastic container inspires fleeting wonder 
while habituating the consumer towards a lack of care for this convenient product. What I found interesting throughout my archival research is that there are plenty of advertisements of plastics that do emphasize care. Take cellophane, for instance, which is a plastic wrap used to package goods. So notice what comes up for you as you look at these two advertisements from the 1950s. And uh, the advertisement on the left has the, the slogan, the best things in life come in cellophane. And then the advertisement on the right says, good things are twice as good in cellophane. Perhaps this is a too literal of a depiction of the sentiment that babies are so cute that they shouldn't be allowed to grow up. I'd like to bring your attention to the phrases at the bottom, at the bottom of both of the advertisements, which state that cellophane ensures the following. You see what you buy, no guesswork. Food comes fresh, stays fresh longer, no waste. All things in cellophane are clean and sanitary. Here, I would like to highlight that plastics were advertised as sustainable and actually preventative of waste during the mid-century. If you cared about food waste, you invested in plastics. And I'll show you two more advertisements that showcase another layer of this theme of care. So on the left, we have an advertisement for cellophane, but it's, it's also an advertisement for smoking and cigarettes because the cellophane is used as the protective barrier in the cigarette. And uh, the two speech bubbles state, shows what it protects. Yes, it keeps cigarettes so fresh. And on the right, you have another advertisement for a very similar material. It's for Ethicel. And Ethicel is basically the same material. It's just that cellophane was the brand name of the product that DuPont introduced. And then Ethicel was Dow Plastics version of cellophane. And the ad says all wrapped up in Ethicel. And we see this representation of the globe that is covered in plastic wrap. So in these two advertisements, if you care about something, you wrap it up in a clear protective plastic layer. Plastic here allows for full viewing pleasure. You can see through it, and it acts as a barrier that separates entities from one another. It is a form of care that optimizes control and homogeneity. Returning back to Mendelssohn's work, know that her sculptures are not transparent. Their painted surfaces are layered and opaque, preventing the viewer from knowing the contents of these vessels. We are invited to care for them without exerting control. Mendelssohn, like many artists, reimagines plastics beyond their manufactured purposes. To circle back to cellophane, well before the advertisements of the 1950s, Four Saints in Three Acts featured a set entirely made out of cellophane. Four Saints in Three Acts is an opera composed by Virgil Thompson and a libretto by Gertrude Stein. It debuted at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut in 1934, quickly becoming a hit, being presented on Broadway, and then it traveled to Chicago. It features an all black cast and is set designed by Florine Stettheimer, who is selected for her high camp aesthetic. Here, cellophane becomes a sensuous surface and a shimmering skin that outfitted the actors, uniting them with the set. There is a really interesting feedback loop between Stedheimer, cellophane, cinema, theater, and fashion here with this, uh, with this opera. Uh, Stedheimer was really looking to the use of cellophane in cinema. So cellophane was oftentimes brought on uh, film sets in order to add a kind of sheen and glimmer at a reasonable price, of course. And so Stedheimer was interested in taking the cinematic effect, um, this, uh, really phenomenal surface quality of the material now to on stage. 
And then when the opera was performed, uh, many department stores uh, kind of jumped on it and they tried to advertise their own uh, cellophane-like effects of their clothing that they were carrying by saying, oh, you can now purchase a suit in three acts or a dress in five acts. And so here we have an instance where um, an artist is really reinventing and reimagining a material that um, maybe was not yet codified as purely packaging, but it was used in cinema. It was, of course, used in packaging, but there was a, a bit of flexibility there in what cellophane could be used for. Plastics are extremely important today. The outbreak of COVID-19 has sparked a need for nitrile gloves, face shields, and plexiglass dividers. I do believe that we have to continue taking and treating this virus seriously. And I also am looking forward to artists helping us reimagine this material landscape of care. In considering Mendelssohn's role within the exhibit Rematerialize, I do not think that she rematerializes plastic or even the animal shaped vessels that she draws upon in her creative practice. Mendelssohn rematerializes care as a connective force rather than a mode of separation or homogeneity. Though I wrote my essay on plastic and plasticity in Mendelssohn's work while sheltering in place and seeing very few friends, family members, and colleagues, Observing the way that she draws together influences from across art historical and museum fields did give me a sense of connection and care. And it helped me rearticulate Hartman's quote from care is an antidote to violence to connection is an antidote to violence. Thank you very much. So I'll now invite Heather back. Hi, and um, hello. Wh while I'm rejoining Roxana, I do invite um, our friends in the audience to write in via the, the Q&A. Um, but thank you so much. And I wanted to say that there were so many moments when I was muted and I was sort of gasping at some of your images, or I, I think that we were, if we were all together, we in a room, we would have heard some um, collective uh, responses to some of the, the images that you've chosen in relation to your research and thinking on this topic. Um, and some of them, you know, so very surprising. Um, and, you know, I wanted to mention that um, in the, the image of the, the four saints in three acts, you know, I mentioned that your work has influenced the way that I think of the exhibition and, and Sherry's work. And I love having this ongoing conversation with you. Um, you know, but this image was an important reminder to me of the history of plastics. And, um, you know, for, for many of us who were born after throwaway culture was um, well established in the United States, um, we don't think about this history of plastic as a material that was once um, considered to have these majestic effects. And when I look at this image that, that you've brought to us, I just think of um, you know, Sherry Mendelssohn's Double Deer with Cup um, or some of her other figures um, that have this like semi-translucent um, sparkly, uh, sparkly surface that you know, recaptures that majesty. And I can almost, I, I can imagine the majestic feeling that um, this opera set would have had. I mean, absolutely. Uh, cellophane was seen as glamorous in the 1930s. And I think that what you really touch upon and what's um, constantly floating around with my interest in plastic and plasticity is really how we value what we value, what are our value systems. And so, uh, you know, in 1934, cellophane was a, a material that was valued and it was seen as as new and innovative and as a, as a material to be cherished. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Gertrude Stein introducing this really um, very avant-garde libretto, um, the cellophane set was also seen as very avant-garde um, and just something to be very, very excited about. Um, also in, in um, conversation with you, um, you've, you've brought to my attention the difference in the appeal between works like Sherry's and the, the plastic bottles that they come from and really like 
thinking about um, in your essay, you talk about the appeal of the industrial design aspects of, of the bottles. And it really brought to my attention, you know, the, the, the appeal behind those original bottles comes from their sterility. And to me, that ties into these images you're sharing from the 1950s of, um, you know, images of plastic as protecting things, um, preventing waste, and closing uh, this great, amazing image of, of ethocell technology. Um, and I think, Shari's work is impactful for the very opposite reason. And I think it is that that jarring distinction between um, you know, the, the clear plastic that is intended to be sanitary and reveal the contents. And then you talk about Shari's work as disclosing the contents. Um, uh, and I think the appeal comes from just a very different um, perspective in that way. And it's um, almost a shock to realize what her works are made of. And I still walk through the gallery and encounter people who, um, you know, even after reading the label, you know, have this aha moment when I, when I more thoroughly explain what they're comprised of. Um, I wanted to ask you about um, a couple questions that I've had uh, as part of our ongoing conversations. Um, I have so, so many questions and points. I'm just trying to decide where to start. But I was thinking about the image that you showed, the, the pre previous image um, to this one um, and thinking about plasticity um, in the you know, 1950s, mid-century, and just wondering about your feelings on um, the connection between uh, plas plastic packaging um, in relation to women's agency. Uh, I, you know, when you're showing these images, it really reminds me of like um, the appeal behind this is because uh, within households, uh, mothers will have the ability to um, have a life outside of um, child care and facilitating easier child care. Uh, and I apologize if this is, um, you know, moving far away from Shari Mendelssohn's work, but I imagine this question might um, come up with other folks. And is that something that you've addressed in your research? I know it's an enormous um, scope of research that you've been involved in. So, uh... That's a fantastic question, and I almost feel like there are just <laughs> many questions in, in the one. So there's the question of, uh, I, mean, I, I think that what's so interesting about artists dealing with plastics is that on the one hand, it's uh, you have to be historically specific to like the moment, the decade, but then this material has this like really curious, um, like a long 20th century history where it originates actually in the later 19th century with the second chemical revolution. And so um, it also has this way of, of looking in a, you have to be historically specific in the way that it's like being used in the culture, but then also it welcomes these questions of like, well, what are the actual origins of the desire to create a plastic material? And then also what are its afterlives? So it almost, in, an, in a curious way to me, introduces these uh, multiple timescapes and it asks questions about afterlives of the material. But um, what I'm hearing is that your question uh, deals with, with like mid-century as in like this moment when um, plastic consumer products are really entering the domestic sphere in the United States and this kind of conf being conflated with also a, um, a a formulation of femininity as being attached to the domestic sphere and as um, a caretaker, a, a homemaker, right? Um, and I don't have any of these advertisements with me today, but of course, um, we start to see a lot of celebration of, for instance, uh, like convenience gadgets such as refrigerators and toasters um, in the 1950s and into the 1960s as like this, these forms of appliances that will revolutionize the domestic sphere and it will um, it will make the the housewife the figure of the housewife so happy but really um, her entire kind of agency is limited to those appliances and working with those appliances so um, there is a kind of pleasure that plastic in consumer products starts to kind of promise to women, but it's only within the context of the first box being the home as a domestic sphere and the second one of performing domestic labor. So whether that is cooking, cleaning, um, childcare, et cetera. Um, 
the question of plasticity is um, is is its own thing, I would say. But for our for the purposes of this question, I'm always interested in where are consumers actually using the product against the grain, and when is uh, whether an artist or um, or a user um, becomes a producer, becomes a imaginative interpreter with these materials and starts to actually create connection um, with them or try to like tries to break out of these boxes. So um, you know we we do have examples of, for instance, um, uh, very successful women with like Tupperware parties, et cetera, right? So women actually did use the kind of the language of consumerism in order to break out of the domestic sphere. It's still within the language of consumer plastics, of course. Um, but the other question here too, is that as you can see that plastic packaging introduces um, a form of care that separates, that puts these really clear and crisp distinctions between one entity and another. And so in general, I am very interested in the moments, whether in culture or in artistic practice, when artists are interested in breaking down those barriers. And, um, and you asked the question about women, and so women breaking down those barriers. Um, because the reality, right, is that um, the domestic sphere is messy, childcare is messy. And so actually, like, this is a very false um, utopian promise that is here on display. Um, so this also contextualizes, I guess, the, the rise of feminist art, feminist performance art in the in the 70s, Mirale, Ukeli's, for instance, thinking about care work and, and child care and domestic work and, and also sanitation work as a feminist act. Um, it, it is a reaction to these kinds of advertisements and this kind of cultural articulation of women as being neatly confined to a role and the domestic sphere and of really having the goal of putting things into clear plastic boxes. <laughs> Thank you for tackling that. Um, no, that that's that's incredible, um, and you know, these images really do emphasize that aspect of a barrier. Um, you know, and also the fact of, of plastic being like an inorganic mm -hmm. material, um, uh, which which you know reads very differently than the way that we read um, Shari Mendelssohn's sculptures. Uh, we have a question comment coming in. Um, and this question is, I wonder if plastic, in a sense, may be seen as a happening. I love that. <laughs> um, that is a great comment. Um, I certainly agree with you. Um, one thing that my research attempts to tackle is to think about the moments that plastic became a noun and plastic became a material um, versus how it was uh, throughout culture. Um, and so for this one, I would just, maybe I'll just jump ahead to a work by Sherry Mendelson just to have um, her on screen. And so, um, so in my research, I find that it's, it was around the 1920s or the 1930s, depending on the country that you're looking at, that the term plastic is introduced as a noun to classify a type of material. And this definition really comes in from chemists and industry people wanting to uh, really kind of codify that this material is called, um, this class of material is called plastics. Uh, prior to that, we have plastic as an adjective, as in plastic art, plastic being, uh, the human being is actually seen as plastic, as having this capacity to change, transform, to maybe uh, be imprinted upon or to imprint change. And so I see this moment with the rise of plastic materials as a moment when um, this kind of Janus phase of plastic emerges, where on the one hand, you have this potential for transformation, um, which I term plasticity, which is I think always in the term plastic before it becomes a noun. 
And then this idea that plastic is now a noun and it is codified as meaning a single thing, which is plastic materials. So I, in my work, try to parse out um, the movement of plasticity, which I do see that many plastic materials do have, which I think is what uh, this fabulous comment is alluding to is that, yes, plastic can be a happening. <laughs> and I think about that as the kind of plasticity aspect of the materials. Um, and then uh, becoming plastic uh, is also a process, as in I do think that the fact that the term plastic became codified to mean a type of material is itself a kind of process of becoming plastic, meaning that it had become rigid, it had become, again, kind of solidified into one meaning. Uh, and so now I, I, I try to play around with this, whether you want to call it a dialectic or I, it's the Janus face of plastic, this plasticity, um, the movement of plasticity versus becoming plastic. I think about, well, how can thought become plastic? How can method become plastic? When in our culture today are things that were designed to be transformative that are um, meant to change, do they actually calcify and harden into a specific set of, of codified rules? Thank you. We've had a couple of um, really great questions come in and I'm my attention is figuring out which one makes the most sense to, um, to pose to you first, but I think I'll, I'll go with what I see on top. Um, the question is, to what extent is plastic valued only in and through the terms of familiar materials, such as glass or ceramic? Is there a specifically plastic aesthetic? What are the parameters? Oh, that's a great question. And it, uh, it's in, I would say that the aesthetic question is very historically specific. So with the, with the origins of plastic materials in the 19th century, um, the earliest plastics were either made in a process that resembled glass making or a process that resembled printmaking. And so, um, so for instance, in Germany, um, the way that uh, plastic materials were actually manufactured kind of evoked or echoed um, glass blowing. And so uh, the, there uh, you have this aesthetic of like, okay, if the, if the material is transparent, then it's seen as very valuable. And if it resembles glass, then it's seen as, as very valuable. Um, very generally speaking in the US, um, we have celluloid, the origin of celluloid and um, it was really like printed. <laughs> um, and so it, it was much more opaque in a way and it was seen for its durability. Um, and early plastics, for instance, were um, seen in like billiard balls that were evoking ivory, but were cheaper than ivory. And were actually on the one hand were answering an ivory shortage and a desire not to kill animals for the product. Um, on the other hand, there was a desire to democratize things like pool and um, these markers of, of a higher standing. Um, and so uh, in early plastics, we do have this pleasure in the material imitating another material. And so um, Robert Friedel writes uh, a lot about this. Um, and he actually documents that in the late 19th century, um, it's not that people wanted to trick themselves. They actually just like really enjoyed the, the trickery of a material evoking something when it was not that thing. And so there's a kind of aesthetic of imitation and, it, and plastic is actually valued for its potential to evoke other materials. I would now jump to the 1960s with the spread of thermoplastics, which are these more kind of like malleable plastics. And I do think that, um, I mean, we have evidence of museum exhibitions called plastic as plastic and plastic presence. And so we have this celebration of plastic in and of itself. Um, but I would, I would say that plastic is an interesting material because um, 
it does not have an inherent meaning as in, um, and it doesn't have an inherent color. And oftentimes it doesn't really have an inherent even like property. Um, you can kind of tweak all of that. And so it really does take on the aesthetics and the values of the period within which it is used and contextualized. Um, in that way, it is very similar to art, as in um, art it changes so much based on context, whether you encounter Sherry Mendelssohn's work in her studio, um, whether you, right, you encounter a plastic bottle in, um, whether it's in a landfill, whether it's in a museum, will change drastically how you approach and how you value um, this object and how you value and approach an artwork. So we have a couple of additional questions that also tie into some of those ideas. Um, so I'll start with the next one, which starts off by referencing your concepts of the, the double anxiety. Um, and, and this starts out, I keep thinking about your framing of plastic historically, but also very much in a contemporary sense as double the use, double the anxiety. Uh, if we think about Mendelssohn's work as more about rematerializing care as a connective force and connection in response to Hartman as an antidote to violence, how do you think Mendelssohn or other artists are reconciling this contradictory ontology of plastic in the face of these anxieties? Is there some way to sublimate these anxieties in plastic or plasticity? Oh, these are such fabulous questions. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, is there a way to sublimate the anxieties? You know, it's interesting. I guess uh, I would I would ask a question back to that is, do we want to sublimate the anxieties? As in, um, I think what's what's been disconcerting and also exciting about my research focus is that it really highlights that um, whichever new materials that human beings create and whichever uh, technology that human beings introduced will of course have this potential to be used for connection and also the potential to for and to be used for harm it both can happen and so i think what's really important with uh why i think why plastic materials remain very important um within contemporary contexts of like bioethics and the ethics of technology is that these materials really highlight that it's like if a human being introduces a material that has all of these possibilities, we also then have to think about um, what will happen with it. How do we actually manage it? How do what happens after we actually use it and uh, and just throw it away? And so it introduces all of these really interesting, I think, uh, questions that really highlight um, how interdependent we all are. And so I would never want to sublimate the, uh, the fact that sometimes the anxiety of plastic actually um, pushes, I'd say the viewer or the artist into these very generative forms of, of care and accountability and thinking about sustainability and the afterlife of these objects. So um, yeah, I don't know if I necessarily want the anxieties to be sublimated. <laughs> Great, great. And that question came from uh, Maria. Thank you for, the, for that answer. <laughs> um, next question comes from uh, Howie, um, who's, who's thanking you for the wonderful presentation. Hi, Howie. <laughs> um, the question is, could you talk more about the meaning of value in relation to plastic art? Uh, as in plastic is often looked down upon, not only as destructive to the environment, but also cheap and aesthetically unpleasant. We can imagine people carrying plastic bags being out of place in museums and galleries, for example. Um, true. Plastic is often associated with the poor working class. Could you speak more about how the art world has thought about this material and perhaps challenged its classist and sometimes racist association? Thank you so much for that question. Yes, this question of value is, is always, always there. And I also never wanted to go away because I think it's a really important one for uh, speaking about contemporary art and speaking about um, <laughs> most things. Um, so the interesting thing about doing research into historical plastics is that it reveals that at different points, different plastics were very highly valued. 
Um, and so they were actually uh, associated with the middle class or the upper class. So, um, so for instance, I, I mentioned um, how, for instance, uh, celluloid was a seen as a replacement or an imitation, or sometimes even an innovation, uh, innovative material um, that would actually allow more people to have access to um, things like pianos because it appeared in piano keys and then also um, in, in pool tables. Um, what was interesting at the end of the 19th century is that in some cases, a uh, piano with celluloid keys was actually seen as more valuable, like as a more expensive and seen as like just better if it had celluloid keys as opposed to ivory keys because um, it was lighter and um, and it was just uh, the material. And so plastics in some cases are actually seen as very valuable. Um, we also see this with like plastic patents. So like for instance, like Gore-Tex <laughs> fabrics and, and Kevlar are these synthetic materials where um, the, the patents are really highly valued. Um, and so, but the question really is um, uh, at the heart of it is in some ways it's like, how do we deal with uh, art world values? And, um, and of course there are multiple art worlds, but um, what I, the reason why I initially wanted to pursue this project was because I was really curious how did the plastic arts, the so-called plastic arts change with the introduction of plastic. And I did think it was interesting that um, with the rise of plastic as a noun to uh, designate a class of materials, we have a kind of pivot to the term fine art. And of course we have this in English, we still have the term plastic arts in German, for instance, but um, this pivot from plastic art to fine art, I thought was really interesting. So I was curious how um, I would say a dominant narrative of art world, mid-century art world, was actively seeking to articulate a difference uh, from plastic. And uh, in my research and looking at actually um, how main theorists of, of uh, art in the 60s and the 70s were actually using the term plastic and plasticity to designate what they actually did not want in the art. And oftentimes that actually meant a bigger, greater access to art. And so we do have this conflation of, um, of the material as representing perhaps the unwanted, the discarded. And I think that that's one of the many reasons why I'm so uh, obsessed in many ways about this material, because I do think that if um, we kind of uh, really refocus our care and attention to it, it will also lead to um, a greater care for the individuals that, that that material has been associated with. So whether it is the poor or um, you know, these, these brand categories, um, basically it's like if, uh, if there's a hierarchy of materials and um, if plastic is at the very bottom, and if th that very bottom tends to be conflated also with human beings who are not as valued as much, then if we do value those human beings and those materials, which um, inevitably leads to valuing how we're all interdependent, then that will also lead to a better livelihood of these individuals. Thank you. And we're nearing the end of our time, but another question did come in, um, if you'll entertain it. And someone is asking about 3D printing, um, clearly in the context of plastics. Um, the question is, how should we be thinking about 3D printing? You know, what, what, are, what are your thoughts? Such a great question. <laughs> um, oh my gosh, there are, I have so many thoughts about this, but I will make it succinct. I think in general, what's interesting about really thinking about um, plastics and the effects of plastics is that it leads to the question of um, what is the afterlife of this material? What is the afterlife of this work that I'm making? Um, what will happen to it later? And so on the one hand, I think 3D printing is very exciting because it does lead to a democratization. Um, it leads to really fascinating research projects. Um, it really does have a lot of um, democratic potential um, for allowing access. 
But I think just as part of this uh, conversation, we also need to think about um, if it's like a replica of an existing work of art, is it really a good idea just to replicate a plastic artwork with more plastic? And also just the question of, well, what will happen to it? So I would just like to see, um, this is, I guess, a call to action for plastics manufacturers, um, that we that it is more readily accessible to artists and makers to know what is the estimated lifespan of these materials so that people can kind of factor that in as they are making. Um, also, with, with artists, just really thinking about it, um, you know, how long do you want your artwork to last? Um, who is this artwork for? I, I feel like there's a there's a really interesting, I mean, I say burden, but I think there's also an opportunity here for contemporary artists to really reimagine um, the longevity and the afterlife of art. Thank you for that. Um, and just to add a comment, this exhibition has really brought that um, question of the longevity and the finality of art. Um, into the conversation here at the gallery and artists like Ellen Atsui and Jackie Malad being comfortable with their artworks kind of changing over time and, and even Sherry's work. Um, but we do have um, another question that I'd like to fit in if you'll, if you'll entertain it. This is from Liliana. Oh, and, great. Uh, Hi, Liliana. <laughs> I think we're th thinking about, um, you know, the section of your talk with, with the rhetoric surrounding plastics in mid-century. So the question is, how might the rhetoric surrounding plastic have been different in the Soviet bloc in the 1950s through 1980s, especially with respect to value class and Western aesthetics? Oh, great question. <laughs> and uh, I have <laughs> a whole chapter about that. So, um, and it, this could in and of itself be a separate book project, but um, generally speaking, um, Plastic production was definitely folded into um, the industrial myth of the Soviet Union, as in um, we have to create as many resources. And um, there were many five year plans that really celebrated plastic production. Um, the the thing that is slightly different in I would and again, these are generalizations, but um, a, a significant difference in the Soviet Union is that really the expectation was that um, plastics would be used in the service of industry. So there really were not many opportunities where artists paired up with chemists or industrial manufacturers or scientists to reimagine and reinvent the material um, uh, possibilities of plastic. So they were really not state supported and state funded. Um, in the US in the 1960s, we have this really fascinating moment, a pocket of time called the golden age of Palmer um, chemistry when you have a lot of state and national funding for Palmer research and researchers are actually inviting artists to weigh in on what could be possible with these materials. So that's a, a big, big difference. But in my research, what I found so fascinating was that, um, and, and for this, I really focused on um, the historic Czechoslovakia and the way that the term plastic appears um, throughout the 1960s in Czechoslovakia. And plastic is very important. And it's seen as both a material that artists want access to, they often do not have access to, because again, the expectation is that plastic will be used in the service of industry. But um, plastic takes on this really fascinating political articulation um, that is outside of capitalist and also outside of communist structures. It's also outside of a totalitarian structure. Um, plastic becomes the model of political citizenship where the citizen is actually able to change, transform, and grow, hence the malleability or, or the plasticity of plastic. But the, um, the citizen does not break. It does not just melt like clay. It does not just dissolve. And so um, because uh, like, the animator Jan Svankmeyer in the 1980s has um, this really, really great short film where um, basically you have a lump of clay and there's a giant hand that is representing um, the Soviet powers that be. 
um, and Stalinist regime. And so this giant hand reaches into the clay pail and pulls out a chunk of clay and just forms it into this little um, human figure. And the human figure goes on an assembly line. And at the end of the assembly line, the human figure actually just dissolves again into the, the, the clay. And so there's this idea here that if you don't have a kind of backbone, if you don't have a kind of boundary, then you will be susceptible to a totalitarian regime. But at the same time, if you're too rigid, then you're not going to be able to change, transform, grow, and improve. And so plastic materials were actually very, very important conceptually for artists in the Eastern um, Europe but they oftentimes did not have access to them to the degree that uh, Western European and North American artists did. Uh, Liliana, thank you for that question. And Roxana, thank you for, for that response. And um, you know, we'll all look forward to that chapter uh, <laughs> uh, and, your, and your book project as a whole. That's really exciting. And, and thank you for being so responsive to the very diverse array of questions that we have thrown at you and um, allowing us to, to tap into your, your thinking and research on this subject matter. And, um, you know, just for bringing this uh, really important and inspiring concept of care to us in a difficult time. I think all of our um, audience participants who have joined us today in this moment um, for, for joining us. And, you know, I'm going to prepare to tune out and just wish everyone a peaceful weekend. Thank you, Roxana, for joining us. Thank you, Heather. And thank you all, everyone, for joining and take great care.